So, with the current happenings throughout the manga and Sukuna, you know, decided to cheat code the absolute hell out of Megami's body, I think we should all jump back and take a look at the very first time we witnessed the spectacle that is the eight-handled sword divergent Silla Divine General Maharaga and this monolithic creature's battle against another ancient figure inside of the Jujutsu Kaisen universe. Yes, today we are revisiting one of the most hyped battles to come out of the Shibuya Incident arc, the illustrious 15 Fingers Sukuna versus the God Shikigami Maharaga. Obviously, I shan't even need to say this, but Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2 and just like massive spoilers in general as who knows what else I might allude to here, but sit back and relax as we watch half of Shibuya get wiped from reality. So, funnily enough, we don't actually just start off straight with a battle here. Before that, I need to go over the moments that lead up to the historic fight. Following Megami's peculiar fight with his own resurrected father, he notices that the dude's face has randomly changed back. Questioning why Toji would have just, you know, done that when he uh, committed Kumicide, he pushes it aside to focus on fighting the others, only to be suddenly assaulted by the luckiest creep on the planet, Haruta Shigimo. The curse user slashes Megami from behind with his hand sword curse tool, dropping him to the floor and seemingly ending his run. So skipping away from Megami and after seeing what everyone else is up to in Shibuya for you know a few chapters here, we skip back to see that Megami has somehow managed to get back up and begun to hobble away from the creep. As we learned earlier on in the series, the 10 shadows technique begins when a sorcerer receives two divine dogs. Megami explains that in order to use the other Shikigami, the sorcerer must work together with his dogs to take down and exercise them. This way, they gain more and more types of Shikigami, all with different types of utilities. However, they are limited to a maximum of only 10. Wondering if he's finished explaining this useless information to him, Shigemo explains himself that Nobara in his previous fight was also pretty strong. To him, it's surprising how young but strong everyone is here. He knows that Megami is already on his last legs, still he doesn't see an opening to get in and land the finishing blow. Moments later, as he just suspected though, Megami collapses to the floor after losing too much blood. Man isn't done though, crawling now he continues with his previous rant. So, you see guys, the thing is you can actually implement help from other people to take down a Shikigami, but that also nullifies the technique's ritual effect. For a sorcerer, it may seem like a pointless exorcism with wasted energy. However my weebs, even a pointless exorcism is important if used correctly. Weebs and Dejins alike, do you all know the exact reason as to why the Goku family and the Zenins are all on bad terms right here? Obviously, you probably don't as it was never explained before this moment in the manga, or only alluded to, but according to Gojo, it was during the Edo period, maybe, maybe later? But that matters nonetheless, throughout that time period, the respected heads of each household killed each other in a fight before the aristocracy. Just like in today's climate, back then, the Gojo family had someone of great power with the limitless curse technique and six eyes. Still, they were taken out by a user of the Ten Shadows technique like Megami. Back in Shibuya, and in a moment of utter despair now, Megami bet that back then the kid of the Zenins probably used this technique in a similar way. Blah 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 blah, fed up and just done with it all now. Shigemo just gets annoyed with Megami's ramblings, when all of a sudden, the entirety of the city begins to rumble. Jokes, it isn't, uh, it isn't Megami though, it's just old Sukuna going absolutely ham in the distance with his current battle against Jogo. Shigemo is momentarily distracted by the nearby clash between them, and by the time he turns his attention back to Megami, the sorcerer has finished revealing his technique. With his hands together, he states that you can't use the Shikigami unless you exercise it, but you can summon them at any time you want for that said ritual attempt. Not a single sorcerer to ever use the Ten Shadows technique had ever been able to take this creature under their control. Realizing like the mistake of his ways, Shigemo rushes forth in an attempt to stop him. This time though, and as the wolves begin to howl, Megami states that with this treasure I summon, eight-handled, sword divergent, Silla divine, general, Maharaga. Forced to take part in this exorcism ritual, Shigemo understands he and Megami have to defeat Maharaga to survive. However, Megami himself knows that he's far too injured, and in that moment, he apologizes to Yuji for what's about to come. Looking at his opponent, Megami mockingly wishes him good luck as he'll be the first to pass on here. In an instant, Maharaga violently knocks Megami aside, sending him shooting into a nearby building, leaving him completely incapacitated. Turning around, Maharaga sets its sights on Shigemo next, causing him to panic and scream for Megami to wake back up. Sukuna, who as I said was nearby doing our Jogo one just before, notices the situation and while in mid-conversation with Arume, tells his friend that he has to go deal with some urgent business. Before leaving though, Sukuna remarks that it really won't be long until he's completely free. Then, in a matter of milliseconds, uses his immense speed to rescue Shigemo before he's crushed by Maharaga's thundering strike. 
Crawling up next to Megami, who's just wasted up against the wall, he notices that the kid's in a suspended state of death, so pretty much a coma. Thus, in his eyes, it was most likely a good idea to save the fodder loser who was dragged into the exorcism ritual. By rescuing the curse user, Sukuna avoided ending the ritual, saving Megami's life. Sukuna confirms that his hunch was right and recognizes the crazy situation Megami is currently in. He's also concerned for the dude's health and uses his reverse curse technique to save him while telling the young sorcerer to not die as there's still something he needs him to do. To cement the safety of Megami, as man will die if the actual ritual fails at all, Sukuna knows that even as an outsider to the whole thing, he has to defeat Maharaga here and now. Initiating the battle against the 15 finger Sukuna, Maharaga slams his blade down, causing the ground to begin cracking under the pressure exerted on Sukuna and sending a shockwave that blasts Shigemo back. While blocking, a weird energy begins to flow from the blade concerning Sukuna. Flipping out of the way, the King of Curses avoids Maharaga's evolving sword, sending it crashing into the ground below. While upside down in media now, Sukuna delivers several rapid fire straight punches to his opponent's chin. Before he lands back on the floor, Sukuna finishes his combination attack by using one of his known curse technique abilities, Dismantle. Instantly, Maharaga's body is sliced with several deep gashes, causing the monolithic creature to momentarily fall down on one knee. Having taken the time to study his opponent, Sukuna recognizes the Shikigami's weapon as the Sword of Extermination, an infamous curse tool used by curse spirits that emits positive energy. He even admits that it would make short work of any normal curse spirit, however, he isn't exactly normal. Returning to the battle, the eight-handed wheel on Maharaga's head turns counterclockwise and suddenly all of its injuries are healed. Sukuna notices this and curious about what could happen next, immediately attacks with another slash. In an insane twist, Maharaga easily manages to deflect it with the Sword of Extermination, surprising Sukuna as he notes that the Shukigami can now see his curse technique. Maharaga prepares to send forth another massive swing, and seeing it, Sukuna chucks up his guard in preparation. This time, and in a change of events, Maharaga comfortably breaks clean through Sukuna's block and sends him crashing through numerous buildings across Shibuya. With a ferocious speed, Maharaga follows him into an office building and as Sukuna jokes that, you know, he wasn't too bad, the Sword of Extermination pierces through the nearby opening and takes the King of Curses by surprise, nearly stabbing Sukuna through the face. In one of those like, holy shit I got a duck moments, Sukuna aerobatically flips out of the way to avoid getting hit. He carries his momentum into a spinning kick that connects and snaps Maharaga's head back. Dropping down, Sukuna mounts to Shikigami's arm before placing his hand on the target's face and charging it with curse energy. Declaring that it's his turn, Sukuna unleashes a massive slash that cuts the entire building in half while slicing vertically down Maharaga's body, who is also seen crashing out of the collapsing structure by the technique. While Maharaga is still shooting back in mid-air, Sukuna capitalizes following up with a powerful axe kick that sends his opponent crashing down several hundred feet into the ground below. Believing that he's probably deduced Maharaga's technique now, Sukuna predicts that he will stand back up and heal again shortly. Right on cue, Maharaga's wheel turns and all of its injuries disappear. Interested in the Shikigami, Sukuna notes that its first attack was kind of similar to the mythical legend of Yamato no Orochi. While its first attack used positive energy, its second adapted to the strike with infused curse energy that allowed him to break Sukuna's guard. Additionally, Maharaga was able to recognize, adapt, and deflect dismantle. Both of these advancements occurred after the eight-handed wheel turned. Due to this, he can deduce that Furu's incarnation of the 10 sacred treasures, which is the Japanese folklore that Megami's technique is based around, and the wheel, represent a complete cycle of harmony. Having taken his time to lay out this information in front of himself, he comes to the conclusion that Maharaga's technique is the ability to adapt to any and all phenomena. Remembering the time he first fought Megami, he admitted that if he had unleashed Maharaga as originally intended during their fight, it would probably have defeated him. Amused, Sukuna thanks Megami for showing him the way and activates his domain expansion, the prolific, malevolent shrine. When it comes to the Demon King himself, Sukuna has two types of slashing attacks, the default slash dismantle and the other cleave, which can be adjusted depending on the target's toughness and curse energy output to cut them down in one go. Most people throughout this series and the universe of Jujutsu Kaisen often make a domain expansion by realizing their innate domain and surrounding it with a barrier to give it structure. Malevolent Shrine differs from every other domain expansion as it doesn't create a separate space using a barrier. Just so I make that a bit more simple, it doesn't have a barrier, okay? Get this, like, like this is how insanely ahead of everyone else Sukuna truly is. The ability to take your domain and realize it without using a barrier for structure is like an artist trying to create a masterpiece. Not just a simple, silly old canvas masterpiece or like some thing inside the Sistine Chapel. No, this is like some masterpiece painted on thin air, a truly divine technique bestowed upon a demonic force. 
Furthermore, Sukuna customizes Malevolent Shrine with a Binding Vow that allows an escape route out of its effective range. As a result, the Pact also increases the maximum range of Sukuna's domain to 200 meters. In order to avoid hitting Megami though, Sukuna narrows that down to about 140 meters. Letting loose, Sukuna states that until the technique is deactivated, Malevolent Shrine will relentlessly attack anything in range. It will cut down anything with cursed energy using cleave and destroy all inanimate objects with dismantle. This results in massive devastation on a citywide scale and takes the lives of numerous civilians who thought they were safe hiding in a building during the rampage outside. Outside and in the pure rage of his attack, it not only decimates Maharaga over and over and over again with an endless barrage of slashing attacks, but over a 130 meter radius of Shibuya is constantly and continuously pummeled until it is flattened to only dust. With buildings and pretty much the entirety of Shibuya falling to bits around him, Sukuna believes that the only way to actually defeat Maharaga is to slaughter it with a new attack before it can adapt. In his eyes, Cleave fits that criteria. Still, if Maharaga hasn't adapted to dismantle specifically, but is slashing attacks instead, then it only leaves him a few moments to attack now before Maharaga's regeneration will be complete, and that is literally what's going on. In order to finish the fight, Sukuna decides to unleash the mysterious pyrokinetic ability he used to defeat Jogo earlier. Instantly, after opening up that like weird dimension or something, Sukuna fires an immensely powerful fire arrow at Maharaga before the creature could fully regenerate, creating a giant explosive pillar of fire from the impact that completely annihilates the Shikigami. After the dust settles, and while like completely immobilized in awe, Shikamo just stands there as the King of Curses walks over towards him with the wheel. Throwing it next to the pathetic child, Sukuna watches as the wheel ends up disintegrating, signifying the conclusion of the exorcism ritual. Standing there now and wondering what the freak next to him is even looking at, Sukuna tells the curse user to be gone, prompting Shigemo to flee in joy. So, the reason like for this dude's insane levels of luck throughout Shibuya in general and just, you know, like everything that we've seen from him so far, is because his technique actually stores up a number of little miracles. The little everyday miracles are erased from his memory like they never even happened, then stored for when his life is in danger. The markings under his eyes signify how many miracles are stored up. Weirdly enough though, and continuing with the theme of Shikamo just being a complete nutter, he isn't even aware of this simple fact. Then, like even more of a nutter, he doesn't run away from the devastation, he decides to run straight into the devastation of Shibuya, not realizing that Sukuna's domain expansion is still completely active. Now, it'd probably be alright if he had some miracles left over, but in fact, he's actually used up all of his techniques remaining luck throughout his battle with Nanami, and because of that, Shikamo's body slides apart, having been completely sliced in half by Sukuna's domain. Back over with the king, Man notices that he doesn't have much control over Yuji's body, so in the final moments, he sneakily rushes Megumi to the Shibuya toll gate where Yaga and Shouhu are so he can be healed. Immediately after, Sukuna returns to Dogenzaka and relinquishes control over Yuji's body, asking the young sorcerer to take a good look at the destruction that took place in his stead. So I uh, continue slightly on after the Maharaga battle just to give a little bit of context as to what was going on there, but that there was just the first time we ever get to bear witness to the monolith that is Maharaga. If you want me to like individually cover some other fights from throughout Shibuya, like when Toji ruined Dagon or the Sukuna vs Jogo battle that happened before this one, then chuck a comment down below and if you are new around here and want similar content just like this but for a multitude of different series, then make sure you hit that subscribe button and push this video to 5k likes so I know you all want more. Of course, check out the Patreon if you want early access to videos, but for now, it's been your professional degenerate, Diavolo, and I will see you all in a bit. Bye.